welcome to the ePath Shala lecture series in computer science. We are discussing about the computer architecture course. We are going to look at further techniques that can be used for uh, improving the performance of caches. So, in the earlier module we looked at uh, the average definition for average memory access time. So, you know the average memory access time is hit time plus miss rate into miss penalty. So, reducing any of these factors will actually improve your cache performance. We looked at different techniques like multi-level caches, critical word first, read miss before write miss, merging write buffers and victim caches for reducing the miss penalty. And then we looked at techniques like larger block size, larger cache size, higher associativity, way prediction and pseudo associativity and compiler optimizations for reducing the miss rate. Now, in this module, we are going to look at techniques which will help reduce either the miss penalty or the miss rate via parallelism, namely non-blocking caches, multi-banked caches, hardware and compiler based prefetching. We will also look at techniques which will try to reduce the hit time in the cache, namely small and simple caches, avoiding address translation, pipelined cache access and trace caches. So, we look at reducing the cache miss penalty or miss rate via parallelism. So, there are four optimizations which we look at for addressing the increase, uh, increasing miss penalty rate via parallelism. Increasing miss penalty pe performance related to miss penalty or miss rate. One is non-blocking of caches to reduce the stalls on cache misses. The second one is multi-banked caches. The third one is hardware prefetching of instructions and data. The fourth one is compiler controlled prefetching. So, the first concept that we look at is non-blocking of caches. What do you mean by non-blocking of caches is non-blocking caches are also called lockup free caches. So, normally what happens is say for example, the processor generates a request to a location in cache, it misses in the cache and because this has missed in the cache. Do you allow the processor to perform further accesses to the cache or do you stall the processor till the, the miss is serviced? Say for example, there is an instruction cache miss, do you allow the processor to further access the data cache for example? So, if you do not allow the processor to access the cache further when there is a miss, it is called a blocking cache or a locked cache. On the other hand, if you allow the processor to access the cache in spite of a miss happening, it is called a non-blocking cache or a lockup free cache. So, basically we talk about hit under miss. So, there is already a miss happening. In spite of the miss, you allow the processor to generate another request and it probably might be a hit under a miss. You can also have multiple outstanding misses and still allow the processor to access the cache. That is called a hit under multiple misses. So, this is the concept of non-blocking caches. So, this diagram shows you the uh, rate of the cache miss penalty for various uh, uh, benchmark programs with uh, different types of outstanding misses. And you will have to remember that L2 must support this, your L2 cache must support this and in general processors can hide the L1 miss penalty, but not the L2 miss penalty. So, we will have to look at techniques which will try to optimize uh, the cache performance. Now, this uh, concept of non-blocking or lockup free caches escalates the potential benefits of such a scheme by allowing the data cache to continue to supply cache hits even during a miss and it reduces the effective miss penalty by being helpful during a miss instead of ignoring the CPU requests. Now, this concept significantly increases the complexity of the cache controller as there can be multiple outstanding memory accesses. So, this is the downside of your non-blocking cache or lockup free cache because as you know that there is already a miss pending and you are allowing the processor to access the cache further. So, the cache controller should be complicated enough to handle such uh, multiple outstanding uh, misses and you also have difficulties with performance evaluation. How do you know when the miss was serviced? How do you evaluate the performance of a miss? Because a cache miss does not necessarily stall the CPU, the CPU goes ahead and does other accesses. And there is also a possibility of occurrence of more than one miss, miss request to the same block. So, what do you do for that is the hardware must check on misses to avoid incoherency problem and to say also save time. 
that is the first concept that we uh, looked at. Now, the second concept that we are looking at is multi banked caches. Normally, when you look at uh, data being transferred between uh, say the cache and the main memory, you have blocks of data being transferred between the cache and the main memory. Now, when you are looking at a single uh, block of a block of data being transferred to the cache and if you are only looking at sequential accesses, normally once an address is sent out to main memory, the same memory module cannot accept the uh, another address to the same block. So, you cannot have uh, parallel accesses done on the same memory module. So, that restricts your memory access and uh, it increases the miss penalty. Instead, if you look at uh, interleaved memories, you know that you can increase the bandwidth and you can do parallel access. Now, the same concept can be used for uh, caching also in caches also, where you try to look at multi banked caches. So, as you can see here, you have four banks indicated in the caches. So, bank 0, bank 1, bank 2 and bank 3 and you find that the blocks are actually interleaved. So, you have a block 0 here, a block 1 in bank 1, block, bank, block 2 in bank 2 and block 3 in bank 3. So, the ba blocks are actually interleaved across the various banks and because of this, you know that there is a possibility of doing parallel access because uh, block 0 is accessed from bank 0, block 1 is accessed from bank 1, uh, block 2 is addressed from bank 2 and block 3 can be accessed from bank 3. So, the blocks are interleaved across the various banks and this helps you do a parallel access across the various banks. So, this is similar to the concept that I discussed with respect to main memories just now. So, just like how you can have parallel access happening on different memory modules of your main memory which will help improve the transfer time and reduce the miss penalty. Here also you can do parallel access happening on the various banks. So, this shows four way interleaved cache banks using block addressing. So, if you assume that there are 64 bytes per block, each of these addresses will be multiplied by 64 to get the byte addressing. So, if you look at uh, architectures that support this type of multi banked caches, you have the ARM Cortex A8 which supports 1 to 4 banks for the L2 cache and you have your Intel i7 which supports 4 banks for L1 and 8 banks for L2. So, basically the concept here is to organize the cache as independent banks in order to support simultaneous access. So, that is the concept of your multi banks. Uh, the third concept that we are going to look at is hardware prefetching of instructions and data. Uh, so, here what the hardware does is the hardware is going to predict that this is what is going to be required next and try to do a prefetch of instructions and data. A uh, very, very simple approach to follow is because you know that you are going to after all exploit the spatial locality of reference, when the instruction cache fetches one block of data on demand, it also fetches the subsequent block of data from the instruction cache and obviously it cannot store put it into your instruction cache but it stores it into what is called an instruction stream buffer. So, when the, the processor references that uh, block later on, you do not have to go to the main memory and then fetch it, you already prefetched it and you put it into your instruction stream buffer, so you can fetch it from there. So, as I already pointed out, all these most of these concepts are just ideas of bringing in an intermediate buffer and depending upon the functionality for which this buffer or cache is being used, you have different names to it. We have already seen a victim cache, we have already seen a write buffer, now we are looking at an instruction stream buffer. So, you try to exploit the spatial locality of reference and try to fetch the block earlier. Now, the same thing can happen with data also. If you are able to predict that if for example, when you are looking at arrays and all that, you know that the next block data is going to be uh, uh, requested by the processor next. So, what you can do is you can also fetch the data prefetch the data and put it into a data stream buffer. Uh, normally, when you look at data being prefetched, you can have different threads of execution and you can have different data streams that might be requested for. So, you can predict that all these data streams are going to be requested for by the processor. So, you can have multiple data streams that you can prefetch data and load them into these data streams. So, that is what is called hardware prefetching of data. Uh, data access is prefetching. Uh, you find that UltraSpark 3 uh, 
uses this technique to prefetch data where you can have up to 8 simultaneous prefetches happening. Now, all this relies on utilizing your memory bandwidth. Uh, you will have to, uh, the fact that you have to remember is whenever you do any type of prefetching, now this prefetching cannot happen at the expense of stalling the processor on its usual execution. If the processor has generated a normal request, you will have to satisfy that first. Whenever the processor, you are not fetching data for the processor, only then you will have to look at prefetching of instructions or data. So, if it interferes with the demand misses, it can actually lower the performance. So, you will have to make sure that that is not done. And uh, uh, instruction prefetching is more common than data prefetching. Uh, and uh, you can uh, basically take help from compilers which uh, can reduce useless prefetching. So, the compilers can try to exploit the loop level parallelism that is available and give you indication of what is going to be uh, uh, executed next and accordingly you can prefetch data. So, this uh, shows you an example of uh, how the Pentium 4 prefetching has worked for different uh, benchmark programs and how the performance has improved with uh, prefetching. Fetch two blocks on miss including the next sequential block that is the policy followed in your Pentium 4 and how the performance has improved. So, the next technique that we look at uh, for improving your miss penalty or miss improving your miss rate using parallelism is compiler controlled prefetching. Now, when you look at compiler controlled prefetching uh, as against your hardware controlled prefetching, now the compiler tries to prefetch uh, data. So, when the compiler tries to prefetch data, you can have two types of uh, prefetch. One is a register prefetch where it loads data into the registers. The other one is a cache prefetch where it loads data only into the instruction cache. Now, this prefetch can be faulting or non-faulting or binding or non-binding. Now, if the address uh, that whether it is faulting or non-faulting depends on whether the address does or does not cause an exception for virtual address faults and protection violations. Now, non-faulting prefetches simply turn into no ops if they would normally result in an exception using which a normal load instruction could be considered as a faulting register prefetch instruction. Now, the most pre, uh, effective prefetch is that which is semantically invisible to the program. So, if uh, uh, because what we mean by semantically invisible to the program is programmer is it does it does not change the contents of the registers and memory and it should not cause virtual memory faults. Uh, the goal is always to overlap execution with the prefetching data. You cannot stall the execution and then do the prefetch of ins, uh, data or instructions. And uh, as I already pointed out, uh, loop unrolling and software pipelining which we looked at techniques which will try to exploit your instruction level parallelism by exploiting the loop level parallelism that is available in your loops uh, are uh, techniques which the compiler can look at to generate more number of parallel instructions and that will give you an indication of what is it that is going to be fetched next by the processor. So, you can try to look at loop unrolling and software pipelining as guidelines for uh, compiler controlled prefetching. So, so, these are the various techniques that can be used uh, which can be either used to reduce your miss penalty or miss rate via parallelism. Now, the next technique that we are looking at or the last of the optimization techniques is how to reduce the hit time. So, you know your average memory access time is made up of three components, your uh, hit time, your miss rate and the miss penalty. So, so far we have looked at different techniques which will try to either reduce your miss penalty or try to reduce your miss rate. So, now we look at how to reduce your hit time. See, when you have a reference generated by the processor, the reference first of all goes to the cache. Now, in the cache what you are trying to do is you will have to first of all index into the cache, get into a particular tag value after indexing, do the tag comparisons. Only when you do the tag comparison, you know whether it is going to be a hit or a miss. So, after that if it is a hit, you are going to read the data that is available corresponding to that tag. Now, this ta indexing and tag comparison and all that is going to be easy when you go in for direct map caches because indexing is directly done with the help of the block and index information that is available there. 
you index into the cache, do one tag comparison and then get the data. And we have already pointed out an optimization where even when the tag comparison is happening, you can try to read the data beforehand. That optimization also was possible with direct mapping. With the set associative mapping, we also looked at an optimization where you index into that particular set. And when you are indexing into the particular set and when you do a tag comparison, actually speaking you should compare the tags one after the other. But you can try to look at an optimization which we pointed out earlier where by way of way prediction where you predict the way the uh, axis is going to happen and set your multiplexer early. Now all these are techniques that we use in order to access the cache. Now so generally when you look at a cache being accessed you will have to index into the cache, you will have to do a tag comparison and then read the data. So anything that contributes to reducing the time taken to index into your cache and uh, doing the tag comparison and the cache access time itself, all that is going to reduce your hit time. So we look at different techniques which are useful for quickly and efficiently finding out if the data is available in the data in the cache that is determining whether it is a hit or a miss and if it is available getting the data out of the cache. If it is not available in the cache then it becomes a miss rate, a miss. So we have already looked at techniques how, uh, how to reduce the miss rate and we have also, also looked at techniques which will try to improve your or reduce your uh, miss penalty if you have to bring it from the lower level of uh, memory. So now we are only looking at reducing the hit time. So you have different techniques which are used for reducing the hit time. Uh, we will discuss four different techniques, small and simple caches, avoiding address translation during indexing of the cache, pipelined cache access and trace caches. So the first one is small and simple caches. A uh, small and simple caches is always a technique for reducing the hit time. Small and simple is always good. So small hardware is faster and hence a small and simple cache certainly helps hit time. So even when we looked at other optimization techniques, we uh, pointed out these two factors. Say for example, we said if we try to increase the size of the cache, what will happen is you may have no more number of blocks coming in. You may have to check more number of tags if you reduce the, uh, if you increase the associativity. So there are multiple factors that come in when you try to make the cache big and you also try to make the cache more complicated by going in for higher associativity. So all these are techniques which we pointed out earlier, benefits of those techniques, benefits of going in for a larger cache or benefits of increasing the associativity of the cache. Now we are uh, pointing out the fact that if you go in for a larger sized cache, you may have to look at more number of blocks. You, if you go in for higher associativity, you may have to compare more number of tags. So the cache is going to be more complicated. All that is going to increase the time taken to find out whether a block is available in the cache or not. So that definitely has an adverse effect on the hit time. So in order to have slow hit times, you will have to definitely look at small and simple first level caches. And always remember the fact that Though we have looked at different optimizations, you cannot say that when you look at a particular optimization, it will definitely give you improvement in performance. Because many of the optimizations you will find that there will be improvement in performance from one angle, but from the other angle you may also have a deterioration in performance. So you need to have a judicious choice of these optimizations. Uh, and because you know the first level cache, the access of the first level cache is uh, in the critical timing path you are addressing the tag memory, you are comparing tags and then correct, selecting the correct set and then getting data. All this will have to play a role if you have to reduce the hit time. So the in the case of direct map caches as I already pointed out, they can overlap the tag comparison of transmission of data. And since most of the data does hit in the cache, saving a cycle on data access in the cache is a very, very significant result if you are looking at direct mapped caches. Lower associativity reduces power because fewer cache lines are accessed. This is from the power point of view. As you keep reducing the associativity, you find that power definitely increase, uh, reduces. I think we earlier had a slide somewhere which showed you how if you increase the associativity of the caches, the power consumption also increases. 
So, this t shows a slide which tells you the access time for an L1 cache and uh, the cache size as you increase the associativity from one way to two way to four way to eight way, how the access times increase for different uh, uh, sized caches. So, that obviously indicates if your access time increases then definitely uh, you know from this discussion point of view where we are trying to redu reduce the hit time optimizations for reducing the hit time. So, increasing the size definitely uh, reduces your optimization that is performed because it becomes more complex and increasing the associativity also has a negative effect on the hit time. So, this to uh, also tells you as I pointed out how the energy changes. So, as you increase the associativity you find that there is more energy that is dispensed with, there is more energy that is consumed. So, that is also a downside of your increase in associativity. So, increase in associativity will definitely uh, increase your flexibility and reduce your conflict misses that is the uh, benefit of it, but at the same time it has uh, an effect on the hit time. So, the second uh, optimization that we look at is avoiding address translation during indexing of the cache. I have already looked at uh, told you the process that is done. So, normally the processor generates an address using that address you access the cache, decide index into the cache, uh, do the tag comparison and then get the data. So, so far what we have assumed is that we have a physical address that is generated by the processor, you have a physical cache. So, using the physical cache you index into the cache, you also do the tag comparison. So, it is physically indexed and physically tagged. So, those are the types of caches that we have been looking at. But later on we look at how a virtual address is being uh, used. So, the next module will discuss the concept of virtual addresses and virtual memory. So, when you look at a virtual address, so the processor is now gen going to generate only a virtual address. So, how do you send a virtual address to the cache? So, if you are able to use a virtual address and index into the cache and also do the tag comparison, it is called a virtually indexed, virtually tagged cache and we look at a virtual cache in that case. Uh, now, are we going to look at a virtual cache or we are we going to look at a physical cache? What are the problems associated with that? This is what we are going to look at here. Now, if you look at a virtual address, what will happen is first of all the translation will have to happen. If there is a virtual address that you have and you have a physical cache which will have to be mapped using a physical address, unless you do the translation from the virtual address to the physical address the cache cannot be indexed and the cache cannot be tagged. So, you have a problem there. So, uh, can we dispense with the virtual address, uh, physical address totally and can we use a virtual address? So, if you use a virtual address, but you have a lot of problems. One is a protection problem. Normally associated with your uh, virtual address, you have the protection information that is given. So, if you dispense away with your virtual address, you have uh, where do you incorporate the protection information. So, every time the process is switched and you have a virtual address there, uh, you must logically flush the cache otherwise you will get false hits because you do not know whether the uh, block that you have corresponds to this process or a different process. So, you have a cost associated with the time to flush the cache and because the cache is not going to have any blocks corresponding to that process you will also have a number of compulsory misses happening from that cache. The other problem is you may have to deal with aliases or synonyms that is two different virtual addresses may map on to the same physical address. So, if you have this problem and two different virtual addresses uh, map on to the same physical address this aliasing problem will have to be handled with and particularly when you have the IO that will have to interact with caches. You, they need virtual addresses, they cannot handle physical addresses. So, how do you handle this aliasing problem? So, the hardware guarantees that every cache block has a unique physical address. So, that is one solution that is provided by the hardware and the software uh, makes sure that the lower n bits must have the same address. So, as long as it covers the index field and the direct mapping field, they must be unique you cannot have a change, it does not undergo any change during translation and this is called uh, page coloring. And solution to your cache flush depending upon process switches that is happening 
it is always possible for you to add a process identifier tag, a PID tag, PID which identifies the process as well as the address within the process. So, if it is a wrong process, you will not get a hit there. So, using PIDs when can solve the problem. And if index is physical part of the address, can you start the tag access in parallel with translation. Now, if you are going to do that, it limits the cache size to the page size. So, if we want to have bigger caches, can we use the same trick? So, you will have to look at larger page size because only then you can look at larger uh, caches or you can try to look at higher associativity because you know index is nothing but a log of your cache size divided by block size into associativity. So, as you keep increasing your associativity, you can have larger uh, caches and you can also look at page coloring to handle these problems. So, normally what we look at is instead of looking at uh, if it is a physical cache that we are looking at, you try to look at uh, uh, physically indexed and physically tagged caches. So, that might be a problem. A virtual cache on the other hand gives you different problems. So, we might look at uh, virtually indexed and physically tagged cache. So, that is the solution that we have. So, the next optimization that we are looking at is pipelining the cache access. So, in this case what we are trying to do is you pipeline the cache access so that the effective latency of a first level cache hit can be multiple clock cycles giving fast cycle time but slow hits. For example, Pentium look at looks at 1 clock cycle time, Pentium Pro to Pentium 3 look at uh, 2 clock cycle time and your Pentium 4 or i7 looks at floor 4 clock cycles. So, when you pipeline the cache access what you try to do is you increase the number of pipeline stages. Increasing the number of pipeline stages will lead to greater penalty on mispredicted branches and more clock cycles between the issue of the load and the use of the data. But this technique in reality increases the bandwidth of instructions rather than in decreasing the actual latency of a cache hit and this makes it easier to increase associativity because you have more time now you can increase associativity. So, when you look at pipeline cache access, the pipeline tag check and the update of the cache are separate stages. You can for example, the current write tag check can be overlapped or pipelined with your previous write cache update. So, the last concept that we are looking at is a trace cache. Trace cache finds a dynamic sequence of instructions including taken branches to load into a cache block. So, normally what we try to do is we normally look at a sequential flow, you look at uh, the data being loaded into your cache according to that uh, sequence of execution. But when the program is actually executed, you have different branching branches coming in and depending on whether a particular branch is taken or not taken, you have different sequences of execution happening. Now, a trace cache stores these dynamic sequencing of instructions into a trace cache. So, it improves the fetch bandwidth of your instruction uh, fetch unit. So, a trace cache is a very very effective way to uh, meet the complexity associated with fetching of instructions because when you look at particularly multiple issue processors and all that where you will have to supply a lot of instructions for the processor to issue, the instruction fetch unit becomes a bottleneck. So, trace cache stores the instruction according to the execution sequence. So, you are able to provide enough instructions for the process to exit, uh, execute. So, the branch prediction is basically folded into the cache and must be validated along with the addresses to have a valid fetch. Uh, for example, the Intel NetBurst uses the trace cache. The advantages of trace cache is of course, you are utilizing the way the program behaves the data portion. The disadvantage of course, it has much complicated address mapping mechanisms as the addresses are no longer aligned to power of two multiples of the uh, word size. So, to summarize we have looked at different cache optimization techniques so far. So, they have been basically classified into different categories as to techniques that can be used to reduce your miss rate, techniques can be that can be used to reduce your miss penalty and techniques that can be used to reduce your hit time. And uh, depending upon the technique that have been used, uh, you can have uh, techniques which are simple techniques and techniques which can be complicated techniques. 
So, the level of complexity has also been shown. So, this slide again summarizes the cache optimizations that we have looked at and it also tells you which processor uses these techniques. So, to summarize, we know that the average memory access time consists of three components, miss rate, miss penalty and hit time. Reducing any of these factors reduces the average memory access time. Different techniques have been used to reduce miss rate and miss penalty via parallelism. Uh, those techniques that we have discussed in this module are non-blocking caches, multi-bank caches, hardware control prefetching and compiler control prefetching. We have also looked at techniques to reduce the hit time, namely small and simple caches, avoiding address translation during indexing, pipeline cache accesses and trace caches. However, remember that reducing one factor might increase the other factor and a judicious choice has to be made to bring down AT. These are the references. Thank you.